series of videos from the book Kill or K Get Killed by Colonel Rex Applegate. This was written right after World War II started and the Japanese were you know, just attacked us in, in, at Pearl Harbor. And there's some interesting things you need to know about this book. He uh, com goes into great detail where he explains that the Japanese are going to you know, are, are touting their great skills in judo and jujitsu and all that. And he makes it a point to point out that only a few of the Japanese soldiers actually did any judo or jujitsu, and that it required years and years of hard training and patience and practice and timing to become good in jujitsu and judo. And he's absolutely right about that. And therefore, he said most Americans would not want to spend that long trying to learn that sport, and that the claims of the great ability of the jujitsu fighters against a American opponent of the Japanese against the Americans are greatly exaggerated because the Americans have a lot of dirty tricks and know a lot of fighting techniques that can overcome and destroy a Japanese jiu-jitsu or judo player right away. So this is a great series of uh, articles uh, from the book on the kill or get killed by Colonel Rex Applegate talked to the United States military during World War II. First thing he says that you need to do is about there are about a dozen or so spots on the body that are vulnerable that if you'll use these you can attack the guy and uh, that you'll be a guy no matter how good a judo or jiu-jitsu is. He starts with the most vulnerable and goes down. He said the best and the most profitable place to hit somebody most sensitive and vulnerable is to a, a groin. The best way to quickly finish any close quarter fight is to use a strong knee, hand, or foot or blow to the groin and the testicles. This will completely disable the strongest opponent. The strongest hold can be broken if the testicles are grabbed a hit because they're extremely vulnerable and they're not going to likely expect it. You know, if you're practicing judo or jiu-jitsu, you never get to hit or grab someone in the testicles, obviously. So Rex Applegate is writing this so you can actually beat a jiu-jitsu player in the street. In the street, I'm not playing fair jiu-jitsu, folks. In the street, I'm going to grab their groin. I'm going to use the techniques in this book to defeat a jiu-jitsu player in the street. A good knee will go a long way to finishing the fight very quickly. It is done with a hard upper raising power and it's going to do it. Not only the testicles, but the entire groin is susceptible. He calls the testicles the Achilles heel of a man's groin, of, his, of a man's uh, <laughs> anatomy. The next most vulnerable area is the eyes. The eyes are delicate, easy to wrench, and like the testicles, they're part that people instinctively strive to protect. A thumb or a finger to the eye will effectively break up the most determined hold or attacker. A blow fainted at the eyes of the family jewels will cause him to instinctively cover them, and that will leave them wide open for another attack. The eyes are like the testicles that are extremely dangerous. A finger or a gouge will stop the most determined attack. So if someone's doing jiu-jitsu on you and you smash your thumb or your finger or your palm into their eye, they're going to let go. Now next to some neck areas, a hard blow to the windpipe and the Adam's apple will have fatal results. Blows delivered by the side of the hand to the throat will always disable and can kill somebody. A windpipe blow, the windpipe is unprotected, a sharp blow here will have fatal results. The area just below the apple, Adam's apple is the most vulnerable. So he's telling you, hit these guys right in the throat, right below the Adam's apple, the nape of the neck. The hand blow here will cause an instant knockout. A light blow will have a stunning effect. So he's telling you, attack the neck with your open hand right below the throat with your uh, shuto strike will disable the strongest of guys. The back of the nape of the neck will cause an instant knockout. And if you do it lower, you can break their neck. The back of the kidneys area. There's a physiology shows that there are muscles and nerves that will go all along the back, the back of the kidneys. A blow there c can deliver uh, is most effective, and also the stomach area, then the nose and the temples, the jaw, the joints, the sensitive bones. So let's see where he's going next. He's going to talk about striking all of these deadly areas. Here you're being grabbed by an opponent around the waist. You destroy their balance and by smashing your feet into their chin. Gradle the greater physique and strength means nothing if you don't have balance. Here you see a large man on the in this picture here picking up a smaller man. But you'll also notice that whenever he pushes on his chin, 
The smaller man destroys the big man's balance and prevents the use of su superior strength. The larger man is unable to lift him, so he always advocates destroying a person's balance. And we use this a lot in our jiu-jitsu and karate where we'll redirect their force so they can no longer control us by use because judo relies almost primarily on balance. You want to not try to stop momentum but redirect it. This is this good body balance in an attack. A good position will meet an attack from which to launch one's body crouch and feet slightly bent apart the knees flex. The hands are out in front can they be used as a defense and a strike as a blow. So you're going to have a nice balance attack. You can destroy walking balance. Let someone try to walk past you, then reach out and place your forefinger under his nose and force the head back, preventing him from walking past you. If they're right underneath your nose is a great balance area here. You simply stick your finger or your hand underneath a guy's nose and push up on it. They will not be able to move, folks. You can completely control them and dominate them. You can stop anybody from any movement. What you've done is redirect their force and gone to a, a temporal area that's so delicate that they have to stop or they're going to be dangered. You want to use the maximum force? And now I'm going to give you a copy of this book with this program so you can you can read it. Learn, you can read it because it's got some great stuff here. Use the foot for kicking. The best kick utilizes the whole length of the foot. The striking area should be large enough to assure that you are accurate. The toe kick, the toe first, and the standing to moving opponent is likely to miss, causing the kicker to lose his balance. So he doesn't like you to kick with your toes. He wants you to kick with the entire foot because if you do a toe kick you can miss and you can lose your balance. Many fights can be stopped before they have a chance to start by a well-placed kick to the opponent's knees. When the opponent's standing kick should be generally delivered to the outside leg, to the sole or the inside of the foot. So he has some great tips about here. The best way is to use your feet. Side facing the target. Raise the leg up and lash it out. Boldly balance, body balance is retained by bending the body in the opposite direction of the kick. So here is just a simple, this is a kick that was taught to the military during World War II to defeat the Japanese. And you know what? We did defeat them, folks. So you can beat jiu-jitsu in the street. It's a myth. That's why they're not winning as much in the cage inside the rings anymore. The knee kick. A determined attack can be stopped quickly by the knee kick. Blow directed to the knee kick, the, the blow directed at the kneecap will break or dislodge the knee hinge. It is very effective against any frontal attack even if the attacker is armed with a club or a bladed weapon. Notice how the kicker's body is bent back. One of the arms out of the wrench and the kick is delivered. So you're going to kick him right in the knee with the entire foot and that definitely will stop him here. You can kick the back of the knee and dislodge it and then make them go off balance. You know they teach most of the stuff still in the military today. This is how effective it was. The knee is very susceptible to getting kicks. The back of the knee kick, a kick against the back of the knee will cause the opponent to topple backwards, especially if you pull him. So you remember that. A shin bone kick. So many people don't kick the shins anymore in the martial arts or in practice and stuff. A kick to the outside edge of the shoe, scraping down the shin and falling full force on the small bones on the top of of the opponent's foot is extremely effective. So what they do is not only they kick you in the shin, they scrape their foot all the way down your shin bone, pivoting their hips, hands up to protect your body, and then stomping the foot. So that's called a shin bone kick and scrape. Kick to the temple. A kick to the temple area will cause a concussion and even kill if you're done forceful enough. So many people have no idea what will happen if you punch someone or hit someone in the temple. If you do that, they'll go into a, they can have a concussion, they can have an epileptic fit, and uh, now the new uh, medicine has proved that their brain can start bleeding, and they can actually die from something like that. So a uh, temple is a great area to attack, and in the war, they're going to kick it. A kick to the ribs, the flat or back edge of the heel will crush the rib cage and cause fatal injury. Now, they used to teach this a lot in the military, and they still do, and you hold the arm up, it makes it more effective. When the arm is down, he could bring it up to protect himself, but at the same time, he has a lot more strength. When the arm is raised up and you stomp someone in the floating ribs, 
you will crush the ribs, you'll deflate the lungs, and you can sometimes kill them by stomping them right there in the ribs. Now he also advocates some blows with the hands. The chin jab is extremely effective. The correct hand in position for jabbing the chin. The fingers are spread apart giving the palm a rigidity. So you open your fingers. Your palm is not powerful. He believes you should open your finger to do it and it'll give you a lot more power when you do a chin jab or chin strike. And he's going to smash it. Now this is obviously a devastating technique. And remember we have to protect these soldiers hands. We got a chin jab and a groin and a knee to the groin. So we're going to smash our hand right into his chin, causing the opponent to fall backwards, followed by a, ten, a chin. Uh, you're going to knee him in the groin. That will cause him to lurch forward. When he lurches forward, he's actually going to be driven into your chin jab. So you're going to easily result in a knockout. If you knee someone in the groin at the same time as you're kicking them or punching them in the head, you're going to create a lot of damage, and you're going to be able to knock him out. And remember, you're going to get an entire copy of this book with this lesson so that you can go through it. Now he's talking about the knife hand or the shuto hand, the incorrect use of the hand. The illustration on the left shows a hand in the relaxed bent position preventing the use of the weapons. You can't just have your hand fl flexed and, and bent. The right position, the fingers are extended, the thumb is up. This turns the edge of the hand into a sharp weapon. Now unlike in karate, he's teaching you to keep your thumb up. In karate we never do a shuto with our thumb up, we always lock it down so it can't be grabbed or bent. The rabbit punch. This is called the rabbit punch. We call it the knife hand in Shuto now. This blow delivered to the point where the skull joins the spine will knock someone out. In sporting circles, it is called the rabbit punch because they're doing that in boxing a lot. They do the rabbit punch where they hit you in the back of the neck. But this is done with Shuto or a knife hand to the spine at the back of the skull. This will definitely knock you out. It can definitely can break your neck too. So that's a great effective technique. This is one that most of y'all are not familiar with. The, the Shuto under the base of the nose. With directing upward and landing on the joint will cause the known, it will smash into the face and cause unconsciousness and possible fatal hemorrhaging. So if you smash someone under the nose and up with a Shuto, you can cause, you're obviously going to smash their nose. It'll knock them totally unconscious, and it could cause them to fatally hemorrhage. Now, this is the kidney blows. This will give you a stunning effect. It is most effective whenever someone is stooping over. If you've ever been punched in the kidneys, Oscar De La Hoya was fighting. I think it might have been Mosley, or I'm not sure who it was. He got punched in the, the, the kidneys, and he had to stop fighting. And Oscar De La Hoya is a tough guy, but he had to stop fighting because a kidney blow can be just disable you. It just hurts so much. It's like someone dropping a ton of bricks on your body. It feels like you're going to peel over yourself and you've lost complete control of your back and stuff. So a kidney blow will definitely stun you and it'll definitely put you to your knees. The tailbone blow. I bet you I've never seen this. A blow to the tailbone is like a kick to the point is dangerous. If you chop someone right in their tailbone or you kick them right where their butt ends, it is terrifically painful and is very dangerous and it will definitely take care of you folks. It will stop that fighter. Here are two striking areas that he's doing. You're going to strike the side of the neck with the show, Shuto. The blow to the side of the neck will hit his vital nerves, the carotid artery, and cause a knockout. So way back in the 1941, he was teaching to chop the side of the neck right near the right on those nerves right on the carotid artery and you'll knock him unconscious They're, they just started redoing this all the way back in, in, with, with George Dillman and it's like no one ever thought about it it's amazing nobody ever reads books and remembers this stuff was being taught 40 years ago collarbone a downward blow like the blow to the uh, like a police baton will break the collarbone and incapacitate the opponent so I've always thought that it's a great technique to smash a smash the collarbone with a shuto and it only takes about 45 pounds of pressure or maybe 70 but not a lot of pressure to break the collarbone and it will completely prevent them from being able to pick up their arm and they're in a lot of pain so you can knock someone out he's teaching you to knock someone out by hitting them in the side of the neck all the way back in 1941 breaking their collarbone all the way back in 1941 here he's also teaching you to, to chop the wrist and the bicep a sharp blow to the forearm will cause a fracture 
delivered through the muscles of the bicep. This is something that you're just really being taught these days. Now, uh, hitting someone in the bicep, will cr it's called the bicep crush, will cause them to cramp and they can't use that arm. So he's teaching you two great techniques you can use against a jiu-jitsu guy right now. A sharp blow to the wrist and a sharp blow to the triceps and biceps.